From mortal men to gods in Aedra, deathly draugr to demonic daedra, valiant nords to vicious dragons, powerful magic to the eye of Magnus. Skyrim is a game full of secrets and things you may not know, so today we delve into five hidden facts about Skyrim lore. Fact 1. The Truth About Ulfric Stormcloak As a young man, Ulfric was chosen to become a Greybeard. He trained with the Greybeards for 10 years and learned the way of the voice. But before actually becoming a Greybeard, the Great War began. Ulfric felt obligated to fight for the Empire during the Great War, and so he left High Hrothgar in order to do so. In a Thalmor dossier on Ulfric, they have some rather disturbing things to say about him. Ulfric was made to believe the information obtained during his interrogation was crucial to the capture of Imperial City. The city had in fact fallen before he was broken, and then allowed to escape. After the war, contact was made and he has proven his worth as an asset. The so-called Markarth incident was particularly valuable from the point of view of our strategic goals in Skyrim. The constant use of the word asset to describe Ulfric indicates the Thalmor believe Ulfric is helping them in some way, be it directly or indirectly. This has led to three theories regarding Ulfric. First, the Thalmor intentionally set Ulfric free, hoping he would rebel against the Empire and weaken them. This would make Thalmor victory in a potential second great war far easier. Second, the Thalmor used magic and torture to twist Ulfric, and subconsciously implanted the desire to undermine the Empire within him. Third, and most unlikely, Ulfric is actually working directly with the Thalmor to bring down the Empire. Whatever the case may be, this dossier makes you think twice about what Ulfric and the Stormcloaks are doing. Fact 2. Magnus, the God of Magic if you've finished the College of Winterhold questline, you're familiar with the Staff and Eye of Magnus. These two artifacts supposedly belong to someone named Magnus. Which begs the question, who or what is Magnus? Well, Magnus, also known as the God of Magic, is the architect of the mortal realm. He, alongside several other gods, were deceived by Lorcan, the trickster figure of the Elder Scrolls, into creating the mortal realm. Magnus is the one who created the schematics and diagrams necessary to construct it. However, as the mortal realm was forming, Lorcan's treachery became apparent. Magnus would have to sacrifice much of his power in order to create the mortal realm. He chose to terminate the project and fled to Aetherius, the realm of magic. In doing so, Magnus tore a massive hole in Oblivion, which lies between the mortal realm and Aetherius. This hole became the sun and is planet Nern's primary source of magic. Many of the other gods followed Magnus, tearing smaller holes in Oblivion that became the stars. These gods are known as the Magna Gi, or Children of Magnus. Fact 3. The Creation of Maroon's Dagon In Skyrim, there's a Daedric quest called Pieces of the Past that allows you to obtain Maroon's Razor, an artifact of the Daedric Prince Maroon's Dagon. Maroon's Dagon is the Daedric Prince of Destruction, Change, and Ambition, and was the primary antagonist of the Elder Scrolls IV, Oblivion. To start the quest, you have to visit the house of Silas Vesuvius and Dawnstar. In the house, you can find the Mythic Dawn commentaries, which tell of the birth of Dagon. According to the commentaries, Dagon was created in the bowels of Leg by the Magna Gi, the very same group who followed Magnus to Aetherius. Which leaves the question, what exactly is Leg? Lig is supposedly another continent on Nern that is an alternate universe version of Tamriel. Out of game lore states that Lig was created long ago when Nern was folded up, and Tamriel left an imprint that became Lig. Occasionally, Lig bleeds into Tamriel and attempts to metaphorically eat the continent. Supposedly, if you're eaten, then you end up on Lig. Fact 4 Shore and Shazar when traveling to Sovngarde in Skyrim, you hear constant mention of Shore. It's fairly well known that Shore is the embodiment of afterlife in Sovngarde. He's also considered husband of the goddess Kine. But where things get more complicated is Shore is actually the Nordic representation of Lorcan, the same god who tricked Magnus and the other Aedra into creating Nern, and is primarily responsible for the creation of the mortal realm. Lorcan was supposedly killed atop the Adamantine Tower for his treachery during an event known as the Convention. Many believe that this is why Shore was absent from Sovngarde, because he is a representation of Lorcan who is supposedly dead. 
Lorcan is known as the hero god of mankind, but among the elves, he is viewed far more negatively. In fact, Lorcan is the devil figure of the Altmer and Bosmer religions, while the Dunmer view him as a major obstacle they must overcome. The Cyrodiilic representation of Lorcan is Shazar. In the past, godlike figures known as Shazarines have walked planet Nurn. They are said to be mortal incarnations of Lorcan. Ismer Wolfarth and Pelinol Whitestrake are known Shazarines of the past. The following figures are also suspected, but not confirmed, to be Shazarines, or at least connected to the concept of Shazarine in some way. Hialti Earlybeard, otherwise known as Tiber Septim, who became Talos. Zurin Arctus, the Imperial Battle Mage for Tiber Septim. And the last Dragonborn, protagonist of Skyrim. In fact, some believe that Shor is absent from Sovngarde not because he was killed during the convention, but because he is incarnated in the Dragonborn. That is, Shor is not present because you are Shor. Fact 5. Kulpas. In Skyrim, Parthenax makes a rather interesting comment to the Dragonborn. Perhaps this world is simply the egg of the next Kulpa, Lean Vokin? Would you stop the next world from being born? Some of you may be wondering, what is a Kulpa? Well, in the Elder Scrolls, time is actually cyclic, and one of these cycles is called a Kulpa. That is, a period consisting of the birth, life, and death of that cycle of time. Strangely enough, it's indicated that different Kulpas can interact with one another, because father of the half-elf Umaril may have come from a previous Kulpa. Regardless, the reason why Alduin wants to eat the world is in order to end the current Kulpa and begin the next one. In that sense, Alduin's nature as world eater isn't necessarily evil, because the end of the world is immediately followed by its rebirth. However, the Alduin of our Kulpa is a failure. Instead of eating the world as is his duty and lore, he instead chose to dominate and rule over men. That is why Parthenax states that Alduin had strayed from the right path. It is also arguably why Alduin was so weak. A deity in its own sphere is unstoppable, but Alduin strayed from his sphere. This may be why the Dragonborn was able to defeat him. With nobody to eat the world and bring on the next Kalpa, the current Kalpa may well never end. However, Arngear makes an interesting comment that indicates Alduin could return. Perhaps, perhaps not. Dragons are not like normal mortal creatures, and Alduin is unique, even among dragon kind. He may be permitted to return at the end of time to fulfill his destiny as the World Eater. But that is for the gods to decide. You have done your part. If Alduin were to return, this time with the intention to truly eat the world, there would be nobody to stop him. This would undoubtedly mean the end of the current Kulpa. Alright everyone, that's gonna do it for the video. As always, feedback is much appreciated, and if I've been unclear or inaccurate in any way, please feel free to let me know down in the comments. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.